A scam is any means that someone uses to either steal your money or your personal identifying information. Okay, and it's not always easy to spot a fraudster. Like I said, they're good actors. They're good at what they do. And unfortunately, there's a stigma associated with falling for a scam for seniors like myself. We, if we fall for a scam, many times we don't want to talk about it. We don't share it because we're afraid of what other people are going to think or say. And, you know, the problem is, like, there's always someone who might say, how could he fall for that scam? How silly is he? Or, you know, didn't he know it was a scam? And I just got done saying scammers are good. Anyone can fall for a scam. The younger population falls for more scams than we do. Age 18 to 40 fall for more scams than our seniors do. Mm -hmm. The difference is seniors fall for more money. Scammers look at us and think that we might have a nest egg. We might have a pension. We might have social security check coming in. And that's what they're going after with our seniors. Now, how do you spot a scam? There are a lot of different red flags to a scam, but if someone's ever asking you to pay by gift card, it's a good chance it's a scam, okay? No legitimate business, no government agencies ever asking you to make a payment with a gift card. Another way, someone gives you a check. They give you a check, let's say I owed you $100, I write you a check for 150. I tell you I made a mistake and you give me $50 cash back. You give me $50 cash back, the check I give you bounces, you're out the $100 that I was supposed to be giving you, and you're out the $50 that you gave me. So now you're out $150. During COVID, a lot of people, including seniors like myself, were looking for part-time jobs, work from home. And there were a lot of scams around that. And one was you would get an interview online, and then someone would send you a check. They might send you a check for $500. They might tell you to use $200 to buy some supplies, send $300 to Joe Smith. And they would tell you how to send them that money. Joe's part of my scam. You're giving him $300 from your own money. You spent $200 on supplies, my $500 check that you're going to put in your bank is going to bounce. You're going to be out $500. So you, there, anyone can pretend to be anyone on the internet. It's very easy. It's very easy to pretend to be someone else over the phone. They're good actors, like I said. Another way is sending money by wire transfers. If you send money by a wire transfer, it's like giving someone cash. Very difficult to get back once that transaction has been made. Scammers have also been as bold as to have a courier come to your home to pick up cash. And I know a, a, a few seniors in Worcester County that have actually giving money to a courier who is taking it and they were part of the scam. Some couriers are hiding in there. They don't know that they're actually picking up cash, but there are some that are part of the scam as well. And the last one that is um, actually starting to rise to the forefront is cryptocurrency. Are you familiar with cryptocurrency, Pamela? I've heard the word, but I, I'm not, I don't know it. Okay, well, cryptocurrency is unregulated by the government. And basically, I could call you on the phone and I could tell you where there's an ATM in your town or nearby your town where you can put your cash into an ATM and convert it into cryptocurrency where you put it in an account. Then I can give you a code and you can put that code in and the money will be transferred from your account to my account. And now it's gone. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful. Like anytime someone's giving you a check, unless it was a close relative or friend, yeah, I wouldn't take it. And if someone's ever asking you to make a payment with a gift card, that should be a big red flag that goes off. Now, the number one way that scammers reach out to you is been by phone. Now, the telephone has been the number one way for years in this one other way that's really rised up, and now they're almost neck and neck. And that's phishing emails, phishing scams. First one, the telephone. If I get a phone call, I check, I go to my phone, I look at who's calling me, the number or the contact name pops up. If I don't recognize it, I let it go to voicemail. 
And when it goes to voicemail, I can make an educated decision about whether or not I want to call that person back without feeling the pressure of you know, them coercing me into giving uh, information out to them. So never answer a phone if you don't recognize the number. Because like even today, I've had two phone calls where I don't know the number. I would I let it go to voicemail. One did happen to be a friend of mine. The other one, it sounded very much like a scam. So I just swipe it over, delete. You don't go back to them. And if someone ever identifies himself as your bank or a business that you do business with, and they tell you there's a problem with your account, and they give you a number to call, never call that number. Always look up the number on a statement and call them from that or look the number up on your own because the phone number left in your voicemail could be part of a scam. The other one, what I said was the email phishing scams. If you get an email or a text message and there's a link in it and it's asking you to click a link because there's been a problem with either your account, you have to update your information, those are scams and they're running rampant. There are many different forms of this scam, but they all have the same thing, a link. They want you to click on the link and once you do, they're either going to ask you for your personal identifying information, which is your name, birthday, where you live, maybe social security number, Medicare number, things such as that, your bank account information. Okay, so if you click on that link, they're going to ask you that, or they're going to download malware or spyware on your computer. And by that, if they download spyware on your computer, they can steal any information that you have left on your computer. And if you're like some people, some people open up their bank account and they never close it out. They can get into your computer and they can open up your accounts. So it's always important when you're done with any account online, log out. Don't just minimize, log out of your account. Now, these are the top five scams uh, reported by the FTC uh, for age group 70 to 79. Business and government imposters, tech support scams, online shopping, and uh, prizes, sweepstakes, and lottery. And we're going to talk about all five of those throughout the presentation. But the, the number one and two, where they say imposters, I feel almost every scam is some form of an imposter. They're either pretending to be someone, they're pretending to be an organization, they're pretending to be someone or something that they're not, in order to get you to share your information with them. Mm. Have you ever heard of the grandparent scam? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Okay, well, the grandparent scam, I don't know if you watched the news two weeks ago, they, talk, they spoke about the grandparent scam. Grandparent scam has been running rampant. Okay, you get a child on the phone and they're crying. They're saying, Grandma, Grandpa, I'm in trouble. I was in a car accident. I've been arrested. I'm in jail. I need bail. Please help me. Please don't tell mom or dad. If a woman answers, it's grandma. If a male answers, it's grandpa. And I have eight grandchildren. If someone hears a grandchild crying, many times what we do as a grandparent is we say, is that you, Lily? Or is that you, Stephen? We give the child a name. And at that point, they got you. Because now they know that you think they're Lily or they're Stephen or they're Michael. And they go along, yes, it's me. I've been arrested. I'm in trouble. Please help me. Do not tell mom and dad. And it works. Now I'm going to give you an example of one. Woman got a phone call. And the, the child was crying. She's saying, Grandma, Grandma, please help me. I've been arrested. She said, please don't tell mom or dad. And it's a Friday. And she said, if you don't bail me out, Grandma, I'm going to have to stay in jail until Monday. They said, my, I'll have to stay until my hearing. The grandmother ends up paying $9,000 for bail. Courier comes to the home and picks it up. The next day, that grandmother gets a phone call. Grandma, Grandma, I'm in trouble. And then the gentleman gets on the phone. He identifies himself as a police officer. And they tell the, the grandmother that the woman that was driving the other car was pregnant. She lost her baby. Your granddaughter is now facing manslaughter charges. She can face up to 25 years in prison. 
Another gentleman gets on the phone. He identifies himself as an attorney. And he says that the woman is willing to settle out of court for $42,000. Mm. The grandmother paid it, $42,000. Now, when they were speaking to her, they tell the grandmother there is a gag order in effect. She cannot speak about this trial to anyone. So when you go to the bank, you tell them you are making a real estate transaction. If anyone asks what you're doing, if you're making a real estate transaction, that's why you need the money. They're giving her a lie to tell. That should have been a red flag. However, she believes that granddaughter's in trouble. She doesn't want her to go to jail for 25 years. She got the money, she paid it. Three days later, she gets a phone call. The person tells her, your granddaughter is gonna be immediately arrested. Either you or your granddaughter violated the gag order. As a result of that, there's a warrant issued for your granddaughter's arrest. She's going right to jail. Unless you pay the penalty, $57,000. She paid a total of $108,000 to keep your granddaughter out of jail, but the whole thing was a scam. Now, what you have to realize is the $108,000 might be too much for some seniors, could be too much for me. However, it didn't have to be that much. It could be 300. And then I paid it. So now they call me the next day and they give me, get me to give them a thousand. I paid it. Two, three days later, they call me to give them another couple of thousand. You give them it, they're going to come back and they're going to drain. You. And that's what they did with this woman. They got $108,000 out of her. Now, another one, this one, Soared during COVID, the romance scam. Uh, COVID created a unique opportunity. People were stuck in their homes. They were isolated. They were lonely. They were looking for someone to talk to. So someone reaches out to you on social media. They ask you to accept their friend request. They tell you that maybe they're in the military. Maybe they're stationed overseas. Um, but, you know, they're lonely and they're looking for someone to talk to. Now, I'm going to share with you a story of an individual I know. She received a friend request. Uh, the gentleman identified himself as in his mid-50s. Uh, he was going through a divorce. He was in the military, and he was stationed overseas. The woman that he friend requested was in her 70s. She was lonely. She was stuck in her home during COVID, thriving, looking for someone to talk to. She thought about it for a couple of days, accepted his friend request. She thought to herself, because she was married twice, her first marriage and divorce, her second marriage, her husband passed away. She thought, maybe I can help this person with his divorce. She starts talking to him on social media. Before you know it, he sends her a couple small gifts, maybe a thing of flowers or a box of candy. And then he expresses romantic interest within a couple of weeks of talking to him. And he tells her that he eventually, he, when he gets out of the military, he wants to buy a home and he wants to live basically happily ever after with her. He told her that he had money invested in gold and he done quite well with that as well. The woman starts to believe these stories. Like I said, she's lonely and this person's saying everything that she wants to hear. And so then the gentleman says that he would like to come to visit her, but he doesn't have any money because his pay is being held up. There's a glitch in payroll with the United States government because he's in the military and he's not gonna get paid for over a month. But when he finally gets paid, he's gonna get paid retroactive and then he'll be able to pay her back. She sends him some money. He contacts her and says he couldn't use the money for that because his daughter got sick, she's in the hospital. She sends him more money. Every time she would send him money, he would have a reason why he wasn't able to go. There was another expense that showed up. Well, you know what? She sent them over $165,000. Mm. The first $100,000 was basically from gift cards, wire transfers, things like that. The last $65,000 was by check. And that check ended up in a bank in Auburn, Massachusetts. Mm. Her daughter ends up coming over, looking at her finances, and realizes she said, Mom, what's going on? Why are your accounts draining? And then she realizes there's a check deposited in Auburn. 
She called the Auburn police and she spoke to a detective. His name is Detective Keith Chipman. And I remember that name because he was one of the first students I ever had my first third grade class in Spencer, Massachusetts. Well, Detective Chipman was able to get a freeze on that account and she was able to get that $65,000 back. But she was still out over $100,000, which never got back. Come to find out the person who opened that account was only in his 20s. He was never in the military. He wasn't overseas and he wasn't getting a divorce because he was never married. What did he do? He found a picture online of a gentleman in the military. He took what you call a screenshot of that picture and he made that his profile picture. So when you're talking to him online, you're seeing his profile picture, you're thinking you're talking to him. I could take a picture of anyone online and I can make that my profile picture. And I can make you think, because you're not hearing my voice, you're, we're just texting back and forth. Or if I was um, a gentleman still, you know, I took a picture of some other gentleman, I could call you. And you'd still be seeing a picture and my voice would be associated with that picture for you. So you got to be careful. I always say the internet is a great place to keep track of your friends and your family on social media. Okay, it's not a great place necessarily to make new friends because when you receive these requests, you really don't know who that individual is. And many times some of these individuals are just out there and they're trying to prey upon us. They're trying to get our information in or our cash. Mm -hmm. All right, this is just a few of the examples of how a romance scam could work. They might tell you that they're sick, they're hurt, or they're in jail and they need money. They might tell you, like this gentleman invested money in gold. He might tell you, you know, I made $20,000 by investing 5,000. If you want, I'll help you invest your money too. For $2,000, I guarantee I could turn that into 10,000 for you. And so you believe in what he's saying. Next thing you know, you give him $2,000 the $2,000 is gone. And he might even tell you, hey, your 2,000 made $5,000. You want to invest some more money? And then they try to get more out of you, but they're going to disappear with your cash. Pretending to be in the military overseas, they talk about marriage just shortly after meeting you. They tell you that they inherited money and they'd like to spend their life with you. All right, government imposter scams. Uh, there's a lot of them. I can't even touch upon all of them. I'll just mention a few with you. Uh, with COVID coming to an end, one of the popular ones is someone calls you and they tell you that um, your Medicare card has to be renewed. In order for you to get your new Medicare, Medicare card, they have to verify some information. And they're going to go over some of your information with you. And then they're going to ask you for your Medicare card number. Once you give them that, they'll tell you you're all set. Your new card will be in the mail. Well, it's not going to be in the mail because there is no new card, but you just gave someone your information. Now, how can they do that? Well, I'm going to tell you this. 2.5 million people in New England have been breached through uh, medical, where, uh, whether it's a hospital or an imaging center, your information has been breached. In Worcester alone, UMass, St. Beach, Shields MRI were all breached. So they get some of your information. What information? If they have your social from a breach, the companies have to notify you and let you know that your social security was breached and they have to offer you identity theft protection. If your information was breached, but maybe just your name, maybe your address, simple things like that, they'll notify you and tell you to monitor your own credit. Well, if I was a scammer and I was involved in that breach and I got information, I could give you a call and I could say, hi, Pam, uh, this is Dr. Jones's office. How are you doing today? Now, let's pretend your doctor was Dr. Jones. I see you were in the office on January 5th because your back was bothering you. How was that doing? I noticed that the doctor prescribed ibuprofen 800 milligrams for you to take three times a day. Are you still taking that? And then you're answering these questions. He knows so much about you. And you, he'll, he'll say, I just got to verify some information with you. 
Um, you know, the spelling of your last name is, and they'll spell it out for you. They're going to have it correct. Um, your address is, they're going to tell you your address. They know it. Um, your last four of your social security number is 2358. Is that correct? You say, yes. Could you verify your full social security number for me? They just gave you so much information, and now they have in, now they're getting to extract information from you. It's called social engineering, where from a breach, they have a lot of information about you, maybe not enough for identity theft yet. So now they're going to get more information from you. And with any form of identity theft, when someone steals your information, they could use it tomorrow, they could use it next week, they can use it next year. They could use it four years from now. Once your information's out there, and I'm going to tell you all of our information is out there. Uh, what's I forget what's your Victoria? Even Victoria's information is out there. Uh, everyone's information, uh, to some extent, is out there, and people have it. And it's up to us to make sure that we're monitoring our uh, our credit, monitor our monthly statements, bank statements, credit card statements when they come in health insurance statements when they come in so that we're aware of any charges on our accounts. Because if you stay on top of it and if you see something, you can deal with it then, not try to deal with it six months later where it's too late. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, another one. Uh, a woman last week showed me a paper that she received in the mail. On the top of it, it said Social Security Administration. And then it went on to inform her that her social security benefits are being frozen because her social security number was used in fraud, money, money laundering, and theft in the state of Texas. And as a result of this, until her information is cleared up, she will not be receiving any social security benefits. Now, it looked legit if you look at it. And at the bottom of it, it's signed by the attorney general or the signature that uh, from uh, the state of Texas. So you're looking at it, and if you looked up who's the attorney general, you see, oh, is this legit? No, it's not legit. And there was a phone number for her to call. If you call that number, they're going to talk to you. They're going to say, oh, yeah, you know, I, I understand it wasn't you. You seem like a good person. However, your number was used. There are going to be a few fines that they're going to levy against you, and they're going to verify some of your information with you. And then they're going to tell you, don't worry, your Social Security benefits will continue being direct uh, deposit into your account. Even if you didn't call them, your benefits were going to be continuing because it's all a scam. I heard several times about this scam. I've never seen the letter that someone actually had in their hand personally. Last week, I received um, a letter in the mail telling me my home warranty has expired. And it was their final attempt to reach out to me. Well, first of all, I don't have a home warranty. I have homeowner's insurance, but I don't have a home warranty. But when they tell you that your home warranty has expired, it's making you believe that you already have it. And now it's expired, and this was the final attempt for them to give me to renew it. And at that point, they give you a number to call. And they actually even gave me a $199 voucher at the bottom towards the cost of it, which looks like a check, which makes people think, oh, they're giving me money. Well, they're not giving you money. They're going to sell you something that's worthless. And you're buying something that you never had and you might not need. Now, there are legitimate home warranties that people do take out to cover their appliances and everything else. But when someone sends you something and they're telling you, final notice for your renewal, and you never had that before, you can be sure that that's a scam. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a popular one that's been around forever is jury duty scam. You get a phone call and it's telling you you missed your jury duty. As a result of that, there's been a warrant issued for your arrest through the sheriff's department, and they're coming to get you. Mm -hmm. The only way to avoid it is to make a payment immediately, and they usually make you do it through gift cards. All red flags. Uh, the email phishing scam, what I spoke about at the beginning with you. Email phishing scams, you get a, an email or a text message from someone, and many times they go to uh, notify you of a problem with your account. These email phishing scams, most of the time, use a name of a big bank 
of big businesses. They might use the name Amazon. They're using all of the big name places because odds are if you get that email, you do business with them. Uh, so they'll send you an email and they'll tell you there's a problem with your account or you need to update your information. And they might tell you you have 24 hours or 48 hours to do this before your account is closed. Or they might tell you your account is frozen as of we speak. So you have to act now in order to get it activated. Well, red flags, never respond to or click on any links in emails or in text messages where someone's asking you for uh, personal identifying information. Rule of thumb is, if you click on a link, you're probably gonna download malware or spyware, or they're gonna steal your personal identifying information. Just like if someone calls you, someone calls you and they say they're with your bank or they're with a particular business and they're asking you information, never share it. If you call the bank, and they ask you for your name, your social security. Now you have to share. You know who you call. You have to verify who you are so they're not sharing your information with someone else. If you call someone, you verify. If they call you, you do not verify. If you get an email and there's a link, unless you knew of a friend or a family member that was sending you a link, I would not click on it. I would delete any email or any text message that has a link. Like I said, most of them are trying to steal your personal identifying information or download spyware to steal information from you. Now, this is an email that I received in November. And it said, as a new Amazon regulation, we need to ask our customers to update their account information in order to continue using Amazon Shop. Update here. They gave me a link to click on. If the customer does not update their account information in the next 24 hours, your Amazon account will be permanently closed. Now, this is in November they were sending this one out. People are doing their Christmas shop. They don't want their Amazon account to be closed. More likely to click on that link immediately to keep everything active. I don't have an Amazon account, so I know it's a scam to begin with. However, if I did have an Amazon account, I wouldn't click on it. And I wouldn't click on it just because they put an Amazon ID number. It's like putting a badge number. It's trying to make you think it's more efficient. And because they have a badge, it must be real. No, it, it's not. It's a scam. It's a means to try and steal your information from you. Now, this is one from a bank. And I removed the bank's name. However, uh, my bank that I went to, their name was there and it said, verify your online account to resume full access. And it said, visit, click that link to provide required information. Instead of clicking on a link, what I do was I do go online banking. I moved a, a dollar from my checking account to my savings account. And then I moved a dollar from my savings to my checking. My account was not frozen. I then called my bank. I told them about the scam and they had me send the email over to them. Most banks, most businesses on their webpage share particular scams that, uh, you know, fraudsters are using, using their company's name. However, not too many of us are going on their websites looking for this information, even though that it's, you know, it is out there. Uh, Medicare scams and fraud. I already told you about the one where COVID's ended. Another one is an individual gets a phone call. Someone says that they're with Medicare and they're offering you a free piece of apparatus. And they might tell you, and a popular one I heard about was elbow sleeves, knee sleeves. I don't know a senior alive that doesn't have either sore elbows or sore knees. So it works well. They tell you that you're eligible for free elbow braces or knee sleeves. Mm -hmm. free and yeah. then once you say that you're interested you want it they say okay what's your medicare number so they'll tell you it's free to you but they're going to bill medicare so medicare is going to get billed for this piece of apparatus that they're going to send you you're probably going to get an inferior product if you get anything at all down the road if you need like let's say they get your medicare number and they purchase walkers they purchase a wheelchair whatever 
And down the road, you need that piece of apparatus. You may be denied by Medicare because you already had that benefit. So you're gonna be careful with who you share your information with. And remember, Medicare never reaches out to you to find out if you want something for free. You first have to go to a doctor. Your doctor has to prescribe it. He's gonna write you a prescription. Once you get that prescription, then Medicare will either cover or maybe cover positive. But they're not calling people and giving free pieces of equipment to individuals. That's why it's important when you get your Medicare statements to check those. Make sure any services rendered or any pieces of equipment purchased were by you. Because if you see something on an account and you not the one who received that service or item, immediately you contact them where then you can get this issue resolved. Not two years later when all of a sudden I need a piece of equipment and they're telling me I already used that uh, benefit up. Mm -hmm. uh, charitable and disaster relief donations. Mm -hmm. The DA stance on charities, if anyone calls you on the phone, do not donate to the charity. If they're reaching out to you, don't donate. Because if you want to make a donation to a charity, you want to be able to do, you want to put some thought into it. You want to check into the charity to find out what percentage, if I give a dollar, how much of that money goes to them? Is it 96 cents? Is it 50 cents? Is it 10 cents on a dollar? And there's three organizations, Give.org, Charity Navigator, and Wise Given Alliance. If you go on any one of those sites and you put a name of a particular charity in, they have a rating on it. And there are other places that do it as well. I know the Better Business Bureau does it as well. So you can get a rating on from an A plus down to an F. You don't want to donate to a charitable organization that's an F rating because that means the money's really not going to the people that you want it to be going to. Now, uh, a popular one that people always ask me about is what if you get one of those phone calls and it says they're with the police or they're with the fire? Do you make the donation? The answer is no. If you want to make a donation to your local police or fire, give them a call and just tell them, you know, you have a few bucks and you'd like to make a donation. Where can I go to make that donation? And let them tell you. Because some of them are national organizations and some of them are just outright scams where they're just trying to get your money from you. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you do decide to give to a charity, you should always ask them this question. What do they do with your information? Because I had an uncle that passed away, and when he did, one of his um, charities that he donated to was Boys Town. So I thought, you know what, I'll continue that in his name. So I did it for a few years. Within about three years, I, would get, I was getting requests from probably 20 to 30 different charities a year asking me for a donation. And some of them even said, Thank you for your past contribution. We hope we can, you know, count on you again this year. Well, I never donated to them before. However, when they say that, it makes you think that maybe you did, especially if you're a person that makes a few different donations. So you want to ask them what they do, because if they have your information and they're selling it, you might not want to, uh, you have to think twice, do you want to really donate to that organization? Uh, one other thing I was going to say in the chair is now I can't remember. Throw a blank. I'll think about it and I'll come back. Okay. If someone does call you, though, red flag, they're asking you uh, to make a payment immediately, asking you for banking information or credit card donation. Probably a scam. They're pressuring you. Uh, someone says to you, given a donation or even asking for mailed information may result in being inundated with donation requests. So if someone, if you answer the phone and it's somebody asking for donation, you might want to just hang up. Don't ask them to send you the information because once you do that, you might get more information than you want and it's just going to keep on coming and coming and they're trying to get your donations from you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, computer repair and ransom scams. The biggest scam on uh, the computer repair ones is you get a pop-up on your computer and it says Microsoft has been monitoring your computer and they notice you have several viruses. Please call this number. 
And then when you call the number, someone says, you know, this is Microsoft Tech. How may I help you? And then you're going to tell them that you got this pop-up and they're going to tell you that they can help you. Before you know what they ask you for remote access and they're the one moving the cursor on your screen. And they play around with it a little bit. And then they're going to tell you that they fixed the problem and it was $199 or $299. They didn't fix the problem at all. It was a scam. They had a pop-up come up on your computer. About 15 years ago, hmm. I almost fell for that scam. I got the pop-up. My computer wasn't working well that day. I thought to myself, you know what? I called the number. And before I know it, the guy's moving my cursor on my screen. And all of a sudden, I got nervous. I shut down my computer. I unplugged it. It was when they were plugged into the wall. I unplugged it. I brought it to school. And I asked the tech guy if he would take a look at it. If he would take it home and take a look at it. The next day, he brought it back. And he told me, you know, you had a couple of things I cleaned up. You didn't have any viruses. But if you let that guy continue doing what he was doing, who knows what he would have done to your computer and or steal personal information from you. Now, if you're working on your computer and you get a pop-up, and it tells you, please run your virus scan, uh, viruses detected. That's legit. Many computers will tell you that. That's You have virus protection on your computer. It's telling you to run it. It's not giving you a number to call. Uh, the last one I want to talk to you about is door-to-door -door scams. Now, my mother, when she was 69 years old, uh, fell for a door-to-door -door scam. Two gentlemen knocked on her door. They told her that they were in the neighborhood doing driveways and they noticed that she had a handicap ramp and they would feel awful if her wheelchair tipped over in the driveway. So they would give her a reduced price. Now my mother, her whole life was shop as a tech. She could uh, snip out a scam before the person even came to the door. However, my mother just suffered from three strokes. So she wasn't as shop as she used to be. The gentleman comes in, he, she let him in the hole, they, they agreed on a price. She told them that she couldn't write checks anymore. They took it. They said, well, we can fill it out for you. She gave them a check. They went to the bank where her um, money was kept. They wrote it for too much money. They come back to my mother. They ripped the check up in front of her. They tell her they made a mistake on the check. They asked her for another one. She gives it to them. They go off. This time they hit a number that was legit. They were able to take the cash out of her bank and they disappeared. We called the police, the Worcester police basically told us they referred them as gypsies. They come from other states and basically they hit in the summer, they hit in the spring, they hit when people are doing repairs to their homes. And they usually, if someone out of the blue is knocking on your door, offering to do a service for you, a red flag should go up. You weren't looking for it, you don't need it. Now with my mother, she was out the money, but I said to her, more than being out that cash money, you realize how lucky you are. You let someone in your home. Think about what else could have happened. A lot worse than get, taking your money. Now, the money, she was fortunate. She never filled out the check. It was a blank check. It was forged. She did get that money back from her bank. But I, I tried to make her understand how important it is not to let someone in your home. Last summer, electricity skyrocketed. People were dressed uh, with a polo shirt, might say Eversource, it might say National Grid. They might show up at your home and they pull a badge out of their pocket. They show you a badge like this and they'll tell you that, you know, they're with Eversource, they're with National Grid. And just for you speaking with them today, they're going to credit your account for $60 and they're going to look for some ways to save you more money in your home. Once you let them in, one of them is going to ask you to see where your circuit panel box is. When you're showing someone your panel box, the other one goes through your home, looks for jewelry, cash, and steals it. So you got to be careful. If someone ever knocks on your door and they tell you they're with a company that you do business with, but you didn't know that they were coming, don't let them in. Say, wait a minute, the door stays closed. Go look up the number of the company on your own and say, hey, there's two guys here. They say they're with uh, National Grid and they got to gain entrance to my home. Is that true? They say, no, no, it's 911. Okay, and I'll also realize most towns require anyone that goes door to door to get a vendor's license. So if someone's knocking on your door, they should have something to show you, a piece of paper, however they can forge those too. Anyone can print anything they want on a computer. 
and scammers are good at it. They can make you believe they are who they say they are. I don't, do you have any questions, Pam, about any particular scam you're aware of? <laughs> oh, I, I, I think I've intercepted a few here myself, you know, on the phone. The, like I said, the phone, you just want to be very careful. You don't want to share that any information no, unless you're the one to call them. 